Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think it has taken some doing to be able to be here uh, this morning being a Saturday. Um, but what I wanted to do, in, in my view, the topic that we dealt with on Tuesday is very, very important. Unfortunately, I think the time that had been allocated to it was a bit too short. So what I want to do is maybe to touch up on a few other issues relating to um, the core values of judicial office and the other uh, connected issues with which we, we, we dealt with. And then we'll then move on to the, the, the issues that are on the menu for this morning. Are there any particular issues that you would like me to deal with concerning what we dealt with on Tuesday before I move forward? Well, let me, are there any issues? It doesn't seem like there are. So I will just take the liberty to then proceed to touch up a little bit more on some of the issues that we did not deal with. And one of the things that I, make, I must make you aware of is that the judiciary in Namibia has um, adopted a, a code of ethics, judicial code of ethics. I do not know whether the colleagues in the magistracy um, have ever seen it, but it is there and it is what should guide the, you know, every judicial officer in, in this jurisdiction in the conduct of, um, of judicial proceedings. I was waiting for a copy, but I hope I'll be having one by the end of the day, which I will, um, you know, distribute, and we can maybe discuss one or few issues that arise from it. But what I can say is that basically it's also drawn mainly from the, you know, from the Bangalore principles. Now, one of the issues that maybe I want to touch upon a little bit today is the issue of integrity. Um, it is said that moral integrity we normally take for granted. It is more than a virtue. It is a necessity. It is elemental. All that a judge thinks and does is dependent upon it, end of quote. That is integrity. I maybe spoke the other time about that minister who greeted me and hugged me, and he said he took, he had taken the law into his own hands. But what judicial office is about is integrity. People must be able to rely on your word if you give one. And there must be that element of incorruptibility of a judicial officer. Um, I go back to the Republic of Kenya. If you can follow, I spoke about the, the Constitution and how it set up legislation, which was to deal with injustices of the past. A good number of judges were, were, were dismissed from office because of how they had conducted themselves. People came around and said, uh, Judge so-and-so, when we're dealing with the matter of so-and-so, took a bribe, demanded a bribe of me. I paid so many cattle. And he was shown the door. There were others, you know, a, a lot of things that happened. Others had politicians directing how they were to give judgment. And they, they were shown the door. And in the rating... Um, after the, the, the vetting of judges and magistrates, it was said that the judiciary in Kenya was one of the most trusted institutions. People who were looking for directions as to where to go no longer went to police stations, but they went to courts to ask where do you get in order to go to such and such a place. And this is because of the 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 the, 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 the the air or the, the, yeah, the integrity that that process inured upon judicial officers. So it is something that we have to be very, very, very careful about. 
Um, the thing about it is that when someone approaches you for a bribe, they, they, they might do it in, 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 in very public, or rather in very private circumstances. It will only be you and them who know. And you are probably likely to keep your part of the bargain and say nothing about it. But they will be too happy about what has happened. And when you have got good news, you, you do not keep them to yourself, do you? You hear of a relative or a friend or an acquaintance who has a case. And you say, no, no, I know someone who can help you. Who is that person? Magistrate so-and-so. Judge so-and-so. And that is how you, f you find yourself in trouble. In one jurisdiction that shall remain nameless, I, I spoke to a lawyer who is a friend of mine, and he had a case that was um, pending in respect of a client. And then he said, after vigorously looking at the case, considering it, studying the law applicable, he came to what he regarded an ineluctable conclusion that there were no prospects of success in that case. And he advised the client so. The client said, thank you, I'll see you later. Excuse me, he went away. That is the client. And he came back and he said, no, no, now let's go to court. Everything is ready. The lawyer said, ready how? He says, no, no, you go to court I have prepared everything. We are going to get judgment in our favor. 100%, 100%. I've done all the necessary. But I'm the one who's supposed to do preparations for, for, the, for, 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 for court cases. That is the lawyer. He says, no, 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 I've, I've, I've done my part. He says they went there, and he cannot even explain, but the case was won. And he told him that, no, the judge is on our side. I got the judge to work for us, and that is how uh, the case went through. A case that cannot stand scrutiny. I had another instance. This one, I do not know how far true it is, but it was of a, 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 a lawyer who had a client, and, and this client apparently, um, I mean, the lawyer told the client that their case is very, very bad. They are very unlikely to, to succeed with the case. And then the, 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 the client then says, but wh why can't we give the judge a little something? He said, what little something? No, no, just to, you know, to make his heart mellow and uh, acceptable and, uh, you know, uh, towards us. And, and the, the judge, I mean, the lawyer said, that is the last thing you do. Once you do that to that judge, it's the end of the matter you're going to lose. So the client kept quiet, and, and, and the lawyer told him that our case is just hopeless. There's no way, heaven or earth or hell, can we win this case. So they went to court, argued the case, and surprisingly to the lawyer, the case went in their favor. And he said to the client, what happened? This fellow said, no, I took your cue. You said that this judge does, it does not like anything to do with corruption. So what I did is that I took an envelope with the name of our adversary and said, they are the ones who are giving a bribe. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm told that that is how they lost the case. But if there is anything that I should mention is that integrity is the heart and soul of judicial office. It is what gives the office respectability. When people see you, when people interact with you, you must give that air of integrity, of incorruptibility. Because these days, I mean, with everything that is happening, you know, you, you find that you, you want to keep up with the times. And, and this is the one thing about, about the, the legal profession. That, I mean, as much as we have all these developments, you've got social media, you've got rights and other things, which, which are good, but it is not one that is very fast to, you know, to moving forward. And someone says the two places where you'd be comfortable in if you lived 200 years ago, it is the courtroom and church. Sing the same hymns from the hymn book, hymn number 78, whatever it is, and court. Because in court, you, you dress the same, you speak the same, but in terms of how people behave, 
I think a lot has changed, particularly when it comes to legal practitioners and, and in, in some instances, unfortunately, uh, judicial officers. So I think integrity is something that we must take very, very seriously and ensure that we conduct ourselves in a manner that enhances and sustains uh, public confidence in the judiciary as a whole. Because I said, because of one, many may suffer. I can just maybe mention a few things. One, judges should make, when I, I did say that when I speak about judges, I mean judicial officers. So do not exclude yourself. If you do so, you do so to your own peril. Judges should make every effort to ensure that their conduct is above reproach in the view of reasonable, fair-minded, and informed persons. Judges, in addition to observing this high standard personally, should encourage and support its observance by their judicial colleagues. Maybe let me, let me move on. Let me talk about diligence and competence. I probably touched upon it, but I want to zero in a little bit on that. What, what do you understand by, by diligence? I think all those, um, you know, they, 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 they accurately capture, you know, the, 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 the elements. Judges should devote their professional activity to judicial duties, broadly defined, which include not only presiding in court and making decisions, but other judicial tasks essential to the court's operation. I think these days we've got uh, judicial case management here, which takes a lot of our time, but it is how the system is now developing. So a judicial officer now no, no longer, you know, no, no longer focuses on judicial duties. Because some of the issue, things that you have to deal with, although they are judicial, they seem to be a, a, a quite clerical also. Because previously, or what you would do as a judge is to write the order, and you know that the secretary will type it. All you do is maybe initial it. But now, you have to press the button for the order to go. And that takes a lot of time. But this is how the system works. And this is how the statistics are captured. And also, this is how you, as a judicial officer, will ensure that court orders that you issue are accurately conveyed and given to the people who, 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 who are supposed to be guided by them. So this is part of diligence. There was actually a case in, in Swaziland. Um, I can't remember what year it was. There, what happens is that all the judge does is to write the, the, the order on the file cover, granted in terms of one, two, and three, and that's it. He never sees the, the order again. So it's for the registrar to now prepare the order, sign the order, and then it, it, it goes to the parties. So what had happened in this case is that the, they, they wanted the, 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 the applicant, if it was, I can't remember whether it was a summons, but I think it was an application, they wanted the, 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 the house or some property which was you know, a house that was built on some property to be demolished. So the, the, the judge gave an order in terms of prayers one and two, minus the, the, you know, the, 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 the tearing down of the house. And the lawyer came and told the registrar that, no, your order is, is, is not in order. The judge also gave this. And they went and, 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 and demolished a person's house and the judge had not granted such an order. So they had to now go back and try and, uh, you know, and, and they, they, they had to rescind <laughs> the order that was actually carried out. So I think this is part of when I talk about diligence. I'm saying there's a lot of work that judges now do which would go outside what you would call the ordinary four corners of judicial work. Because mostly what we want to do as judicial officers is to sit in court, hear cases, go in chambers and write judgments. But now there is a lot of time. Having to look at each and every file, sometimes we have 30, 40, 50, 60 sometimes, 
um, you know, e-justice cases, and you have, you have to go through each and every one of them. Look at them, know what is required. When lawyers appear in court, you must know what they are talking about. And once you slack in looking and reading and preparing, you are likely to give orders that may be wrong. So it is very, very, very important for a, a, a judicial officer to be diligent, to do all necessary preparations. And when you go to court, do, do not allow the lawyers to tell you what the case is about. You must know what the case is about because they might lead you down the garden path and you find yourself making judgment on an issue that, that is actually not an issue. One of my colleagues in one jurisdiction I worked in um, was under a lot of pressure. I mean, at some stage it was just him. I think there's a time when there were three of us on, on the bench and, and, and that was all in, in the high court. And when I left for Botswana, it was even worse. Lawyers were bringing cases to him and everything. And he ended up forgetting. You'd find that maybe there is a case with points in Limine and then the merits. And the lawyers say, your lordship, we were abandoning prayer or this point in Limine and that other one. And then the judge goes and, and writes his judgment. He forgets. He starts making judgment on the points in Limine. And when the judgment comes back, the lawyer say, no, but judge, this is not what we asked for. You've, you've served us food that we have not asked for, that we did not pay for. So I think diligence is at the core. And then as I said previously, judicial duties should take precedence over all other activities. I had a colleague who liked selling he was selling vegetables, milk, and other things. And sometimes these are the things that steal away judicial time because you want to earn an extra buck. That, that, that is not bad. <laughs> but if the, the, the code allows it, and I think if you are doing anything outside your judicial office, you should then report. Your, your, your other activities must be known and must be sanctioned by the appropriate authorities. So that I think the, the, the intention is that what you do must be subsumed totally and fully in the judicial office so that you do not have divided loyalties, other things craving, um, you know, asking for your attention. And to the extent that you give attention to those things, you give away attention to what is core, which is your, your judicial duties. Judges devote their professional activity to judicial duties. I think that one I've spoken about. And then the judges should take reasonable steps to maintain and enhance their knowledge, skills, personal qualities necessary for the performance of judicial duties. I normally say that once you do law, you are married to books for life. And for me, I found that it also had some negative um, um, repercussions because Everything I was doing, doing work was about reading. Whether you are writing a judgment, whether you are preparing for a case, whether you are preparing, you know, or, or yeah, whatever it is, it's all about reading. So I got to a point where I got tired of reading. And I never read anything else. I told myself, in order for me to relax, I don't read. But then as an individual, you need to, to, to nourish yourself. You need to read maybe some things outside the law, but you need to know what is happening in the world. So I then decided I'm going to read anyhow. So now I'm reading. This year, I don't know how many books I've read. Quite a number. And that is my way of relaxation. But previously, I felt that when I was reading, I was working. But you do need as an individual, besides the law books, to also get something to give you other perspectives because some of the things might not be legal in nature, but you'll find that they, they enable you to know and understand because we're dealing with people who are differently wired from how we are and maybe from reading other material, you might find that that nourishes, that enhances your understanding even of your, your, your duties, what other people maybe expect. So we must keep reading we must keep learning and we must keep following developments in, 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 in particularly in the legal, legal field. 
And then we must also keep ourselves apprised of international trends, in international law, conventions, and instruments which establish uh, human rights norms. We must not allow ourselves to be an island of our own, oh, but we must be integrated in the, you know, and, and particularly for Namibia, because Namibia is a monist. Um, uh, it, 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 the, the constitution in Namibia is monist. Yeah, so in, in Namibia, where there's an international treaty, it automatically becomes part of Namibian law. In South Africa, for instance, there is the, the Rome Statute, the, 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 the statute that creates the International Criminal Court. In South Africa, they had to domesticate it, have a, a legislation passed by parliament that specifically incorporated it and made it part of uh, South African law. But in Namibia, and I'm saying that maybe probably in Namibia, there is more need to be vigilant and know what international trends are, what international treaties you know, are, are now in force, because they automatically become part of Namibian law. So if you do not know that there is a treaty that has been passed on A, B, C, and D, you might prepare a judgment which does not take into account what has recently happened. And you find that you are behind the bus, so to speak. You are behind um, the, the latest developments. Okay. The other issue is that judges shall perform all duties, judicial duties, including delivery of reserve judgments, efficiently, fairly, and with reasonable promptness. Last night, the judge president was talking and saying that gone are the days when people knew that judgments in Namibia would be delivered after 10 years. There are now guidelines in terms of which certain types of judgments must be delivered. And one of the things that I have told myself, in fact, one of my colleagues wrote a paper on, on judgment writing. And he said, or rather it was a lady, and she said, that preparing of a judgment is like preparing a meal. A meal must be prepared and served on time. Otherwise, you might prepare a beautiful meal, not beautiful, very tasty, uh, fairly seasoned, very nice, but you find that by the time you serve it, people have lost interest. They've, 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 they've been hungry, and they are now full. They've eaten, you know, other things. So you find that when the judgment comes, it is no longer of value. Very well prepared, well researched, well written, but it no longer serves the purpose because by the time the judgment comes, no, everyone has lost interest in it. It has become, you know, um, it, it has become useless. So it is then very, very important for judgments to be delivered and delivered on time. And also, let us not trivialize the time, the effort that legal practitioners put into research and the, the, you know, the, 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 the written submissions that they make. Because there are some of us, we find that people have really gone to town to assist the court, write you know, um, fully fledged, fully researched, um, you know, um, written submissions, and the judge just takes a, a, a shortcut. And all the issues that arise, the new cases and whatever, they all go to waste. If we do not use that material, I'm not saying that everything that, must be, that is said must be included in the judgment, but sometimes there's an element of laziness where all you look at is that, what are the timelines? 14 days, ah, just going to go for the jugular. Forget about all these niceties and all these issues that arise. I'm just going, as long as I, I come up with a judgment. And you find that at the end of the day, our jurisprudence becomes the loser because the judges, the judicial officers, are not applying themselves fully to the law. And do not think that because you are sitting in the magistracy, you are not in any way of, I mean, shaping the, the, the jurisprudence in this country. Because some of the issues or the legal issues that arise may start off in the magistrate's courts. 
But because of their importance, they will go up the hierarchy up to the Supreme Court. So do not trivialize the work that you do to say, ah, for me, I just sit in the magistrate's court. I'm just going to do a mundane judgment, and that will be it. No. You have to do, okay, I mean, depending on the cases. I mean, in the high court, there is now practice directive 61, which allows judges in some of the matters, things like, like condonation, uh, summary judgment, amendment of pleadings, um, exceptions, although with me, exceptions, I, I am probably very passionate about them because that is where a lot of the law develops from exceptions. But if it's, if it's a beaten track, there's no need for you to reinvent the wheel. But there are always new issues that, that are coming up. There's one that I, 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 I am presently dealing with. I'm not going to tell you how I've decided it, but or how I will decide it when I do. But it's a case where A took his motor vehicle to a garage for, for, for repairs of some sort. And then B comes there and it takes, the, it, it, it was a, these, these high performance vehicles. It can do 300 kilometers an hour and more. In fact, it, it, it was imported for, from the UK. It, it, it has miles, and so it was, I think it was doing over 180 miles an hour. Or that is how, what it can do. So B comes to the, uh, you know, the, the garage, he likes the car, takes it on a test drive, and the engine gets damaged. So A then sues B for damaging his vehicle, saying that, no, you drove the vehicle um, recklessly, and uh, at high speed, and as a result, the engine has been damaged. And then B, ov obviously, and then what, uh, what B does, he then uh, cites the owners of the garage as, as third parties to the matter. To say, no, you are negligent, you allowed this man to take the vehicle, and all such other things. So at the end of the day, as the case proceeded, A and B decided to settle the matter. Uh, B, which means B admitted liability, yes, I'm going to pay so much, fine. And then at that point, B then decided, no, 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 even though I've settled the matter with A, I'm still going against the third parties. The third parties say, no, but A did not make a case against you. So on what basis are you going to seek a contribution or an in, in indemnica indemnication from us? Because as far as we are concerned, you, I mean, A did not make a case against you, but you decided to settle the matter. Why did you settle the matter? Because one, negligence wasn't proved in the driving of the vehicle, in the driving of the vehicle at a high speed because it's a high performance vehicle in any event. So the jury is out. So what I'm saying is that do not trivialize the matters important, and from those cases may arrive judgments that, that change the course of, 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 of the judicial, I mean, rather, of, 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 of case law, or even, yeah, of, of, of case law in Namibia. And then the other one is that judges shall maintain order and decorum in all proceedings before them. They shall be patient, dignified, and courteous in relation to litigants, witnesses, lawyers, and, other, and others that the court has to deal with. This is also part of, you know, of, 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 of diligence. But we spoke a little bit last week about how it happens where, you know, tensions rise and, 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 and people, you know, behave in all sorts of, of ways, but we said that the, 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 the court or the judge or the judicial officer must actually be in charge of, of what goes on. And there is a judge called Mr. Jackton or Zhuang, um, and, and this, is, this is what he says. He, 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 he wrote a paper in Kenya about the judicial complaints mechanism, and this is what he says. It therefore stands to reason that judges should adequately prepare for cases appearing before them and not wait for the parties to tell them what the cases are about. As the parties' representatives, oh, no, no, this is me speaking, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I thought I was, no, no, it's, it's myself. Yes. I thought, I thought it was, a, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, there is a paper that I refer to written by this particular judge, which is in the footnotes. And if you can please read it, 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 it makes very good reading about what we, we, we need to do. There is this principle called per incurium. Do you know what per incurium means? Per incurium. If you make a judgment per incurium, am I teaching Latin here? No, no, no. Pain curium is where you, 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 you make a judgment unaware that it is not correct. Pain curium, there might be a judgment maybe that rules the other way. So if you make a judgment, pain curium, it means that you are not aware. Sometimes you, you make a judgment and you are not aware that there is a certain statute that exists, which if you had been aware of, precludes you ruling the way that you did. That, that is what pain in curia means. Let me just go here and see. Because these things uh, are now of assistance. It says that, what does it say? It says um, it's through or characterized by lack of due regard to the law or the facts. The decision was made per incuria. And then it says, per incuria, literally translated, means through lack of care. It refers to a judgment of a court which has to be decided without reference to a statutory provision or earlier judgment which would have been relevant. Diligence, yes. So gone should be the days when you make judgments, pain, curium, because we now have the website, we have the law reports, so there's no reason why, you know, you, you, we, 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 I mean, you can make a judgment, pain, curium. And then the other thing that, 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 that sometimes happens, sometimes through diligence you want to be a shining star. The lawyers prepare their heads of argument they argue the case. And then as you read in preparation of judgment, you find a judgment that just wows you. And then you decide, I want to surprise them. <laughs> yeah, I really, really want to surprise them. And then, bam, you bring that judgment and you go one way or the other. I think there's a judgment called, is it Kawes? What happened in Kawes? <laughs> the judge made a judgment without reference to the parties. So even if this excites you, and you are going to be the legal luminary above the lawyers who appeared in the matter, you have to refer to them. I saw such a case, A, B, C, and D. Could you please file brief heads of argument on this case? Because what they might do is to take the matter on appeal and say, no, no, the judge made a judgment. We were never given an opportunity to deal with that particular issue. So as much as we read and want to move forward, but let us also ensure that the, the parties know what issue arises. Unless, you know, it's an issue that is directly connected to what was argued, maybe a later case or whatever. But do not then be seen to, you know, you want to shine, you know, above the parties and then you go ahead and, and, and you start dealing with issues. I mean, because you might find that if you had given the, the lawyers an opportunity to deal with the issue, they might have maybe made some, uh, you know, some argument that might have persuaded you one way or the other. Or even if they have nothing to say, to change what you, you would have said, but at least give them that opportunity. Are there any questions? Or comments for that matter? I don't like it when I seem to be preaching. Because when you preach, people don't have an opportunity to ask questions. 
I now want to deal with the principle of equality. Equality. What does equality deal with? When you speak in the context of that being a core judicial value. Well, equality also talks about treating people the same. One of the problems that I found, I do not know about Namibia, I cannot talk about it, but in Botswana and in Swaziland, most of the magistrates were being recruited from the prosecution. Yes. So in their determination of cases, you could see the influence that that had. So if there's a policeman against an accused, policeman flies with, I mean, he can't lie. This accused is a liar. And in some cases in Botswana, they even had um, uh, prosecutors who were police officers. And that's a problem. Is it not? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yes, because as a prosecutor, you, you are supposed to be independent. But you find that they had police officers who were actually doing prosecutorial work. And then in some instances, you find that the magistrates had themselves been promoted from, from the prosecution. And so you could just see matters going in a skewed direction one way. Convictions, convictions and more convictions. And when matters come on review, you find that they are overturned. Ah, these judges. I... So what you need to do is to treat the parties who appear before you equally. I'm not just talking only about the litigants, but also the lawyers. When a senior counsel appears before you with a junior or even with an attorney with two years' experience, do not then suddenly shift in favor of senior counsel because he's Mr. Soren, so he's well regarded. I, I had a harsh lesson once. I was dealing with a case. I can't even remember what it was about, but it was in Swaziland. One of the, the uh, lawyers who appeared was a senior counsel called Mr. Dave Smith. He was from the Pretoria Bar. And then there was a lady called Miss Van der Valt. She had a very, very strong African uh, accent. She could not express herself very well. You know, and then if it was a, a boxing match, she, she, he would have won the match on points, probably even a knockout, because of the oratory that he displayed. You know, he, he was very, very eloquent, cited cases nicely. And then when I left, I knew that Mr. Smith had won the case. He had won the contest. There was no question. But when I started sitting down, looking at the cases that she cited, and the little that she said, I found that regardless of the abundance of words and the eloquence of speech, the law was on Ms. Van der Waal's side. So you have to listen. Do not be influenced. If uh, there, there, there are some maybe renowned uh, senior counsel in Namibia, even if they appear before you, and then there is someone who is junior, was admitted last month that appears before you, on the other side, it does not matter. Listen to the person, listen to what they say, and look at the law. Do not look at the, the face or the color or whatever of the person who is speaking. The law must be colorblind. The law must be um, neutral, even in terms of age. It does not matter. I mean, you, you respect people, of course, but you cannot say merely because so-and-so has been on the bed, or rather on the, at the bar for so long, and this one is new, then uh, he, he, must, he must be right. No. So you have to treat people equally. And then all those stereotypes that we spoke about a little bit last week, you might have personal problems with people of, who dress like this, who behave like this, who talk like this. But when you come to the judicial office, everyone must be treated the same. All your, 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 your idiosyncrasies, all your, your, you know, whatever, <laughs> if you're a chauvinist or whatever, those things must be thrown outside the window. Just deal with the people as they are. And do not allow those issues to influence how you eventually decide cases. 
And the other thing is that you also need to understand the society where you work. One of the first trips I took when I arrived in Namibia was driving along Evelyn Street. No, I drove along Evelyn Street. And then I went to, what is the dam called? Hawara? I went there, yes. It was month end. And I saw people at their best and at their worst behavior. Why is this important? Because I'm going to be sitting maybe in a, on a criminal case there. When I know what Evelyn Street looks like, when I know and understand how the people there behave, that, that might be very important for purposes of the judgment. We do not need judicial officers who live in an ivory tower. And an ivory tower without windows. They do not know they are, they are detached from the society which they serve. That might actually be at a service. No, I, I don't deal with the people. I don't go to where, you know, you, you then become that class. What will happen is that the judgments that you pass will not resonate with the people. So I'm just talking about that. You know, that you, 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 you have to know, understand the people. And sometimes, you know, from where people come, that might influence the way they behave, and that might be a factor that you take into account. I'm not saying that that necessarily should be the case, but you should understand what happens. I will come back. There are also these cultural issues that you need to understand. For instance, in, in, in our culture, um, the way that many women were brought up is that it, it, it is disrespectful for you to look at a, a male person, particularly one in authority, in the eye. So you'd find that as, as a magistrate or a, a judge, you are sitting there. You see this lady in the witness box. When she's being asked by this man, she looks down. And then you conclude that she's a liar. She was not looking at me, um, you know, in the eye. But you find that it is a different game. Game ball altogether. It is because of how she has been brought up. And it has got nothing to do with her mendacity. I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. I think they go together. All that you need to do is to apply them in a proportionate manner. It is a bad judicial officer who lives in an ivory tower, does not know what happens, and just writes a judgment which may well be uh, in regard to people from Mars when the, the people are actually from Pluto. But at the same time, it does not mean that, I mean, the, the, the understanding is, is to enable you to deal with the matter and go through all the nooks and crannies of the matter. And then you bring a balanced judgment to bear. Because not to know what the society is like is bad. As much as then sympathizing, throwing the law outside the window and say, I know how these people live. He grew up in a very bad atmosphere. Although he stabbed this person, I acquit him because this is what the society has failed to. No, 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 that can't be right. But I think when you, you come down from your exalted seat to see where the people live, how the people live, and you get to understand, when you deal with the issues, you will deal with them with understanding, but not detached from the law. All that you need to do is to strike the proper balance. I, 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 I do not think that these things are mutually exclusive. They go together. Because once you do one to the, to, to the exclusion of the other, injustice might, might, might well result. Who wants to? Yes, ma'am. I, I entirely agree. But, but, but wait is the other way you might find that you do not even wait to, for sentencing to bring those issues. So once this person is in the witness box, he's black, he committed it, he did it. And then you, 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 you find that even, because one of the things I spoke about is that, but it's my policy, I, I'm not, I do not want to impose it on others. I, I do not ask questions normally during, during examination, whether in chief or cross-examination, unless I'm asking only for purposes of clarity. The questions that I have, I ask at the end. But you might find that there are certain judges who 
from the line of the questions that they ask, it is very clear which way the, 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 the trial is going. And, and, the, and these are the things that sometimes you might find that it, it happens because as a human being, you, 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 you get subsumed in what happens. Maybe this man was brutal to this woman that he killed his lover and everything. And then suddenly you, the questions that you ask, how many times did you stab him? <laughs> you know, you, you ask those questions which already show which way you, you are going. And, and these are the things that you, you need to, you know, try and, and, and because, I mean, it's, it's I, I told you um, what Judge Wittele told me about that interpreter who was telling the, 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 the magistrate that, wait, I've put him in a corner. Just leave me a little bit. <laughs> so, I mean, th these are the things that you, you have to shy away from. Because you might find that just one question that you ask, you know, just shows. Or at least, because w one of the things that you must be aware of is that it is the impressions. But that's not the, quite the word that I'm, I'm looking for. Percep yes. It is the perceptions. You might be sitting there as a judicial officer and with all in, in good conscience, you know that you are not biased, you are not anything, but that is not what matters. What matters is the perception of another person. If that is reasonable, you may do it with all good faith, but it will not work. So which is why you have to be very careful about how you behave, what you say, and how you, you, you conduct yourself in court. Because that might be an outward manifestation of a perception to a person. Oh, the way he looked at me, you know, things like those. So I, I think it is very, very important to, 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 to breathe that air of impartiality, that air of equality, you know, with the people that you, 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 you have to deal with. Of course, there are times when you have to raise your voice. You have to be harsh. Ma'am, ma please stop that. Maybe they are not answering questions, they're evasive, all those things. Those you need to do. But you have to do them in a... And, and also, it must be measured. It must be measured. There, there, there are witnesses who, 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 who can, you know, do all sorts of things. I've had to raise my voice a few times. And, um, but you, you have to be careful how, how you do it. And where it is called for, you should do it. But then at the same time... You do not have to keep quiet where things go wrong and say, hey, if I speak, then they will say, now I am, I am taking sides. No, because you must be in charge of your court. If someone does something that is incorrect, you should bring them to order. By so doing, you are not you know, showing any partiality. You actually are in control of, of, your proceed of the proceedings, rather. Okay, let me move on. I think I want now to to deal with a little, a little bit with the relationship with legal practitioners. Judicial officers are not an island of their own. They are human beings, and all human beings are relational in nature. And I do not think it is the purpose that once you become a judge or a judicial officer, then suddenly you need to cut ties with society, with people that you grew up with, with people that you studied with, with people that maybe you share interests with. The issue is how to manage the, the, the relationship. And you should do so in a manner that does not cast suspicion on your performance as a judicial officer. But at the same time, the one who is making the judgment of your behavior must be someone who is informed. Because with some clients, let, let's say you, 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 in fact, uh, you, you are in court. I mean, let me talk about lawyers, not, not even judicial officers. If there are two lawyers, one on opposite ends, appearing before a, a, a court, if during the adjournment, the lawyers are seen talking together or maybe they go and have tea together or, or lunch together. I have heard of lawyers who have been castigated by their, by their clients. Oh, now you are sitting with that man. But we are fighting these people and, and now you, you are talking to them. Let me go and find another lawyer. So I'm talking about someone who's maybe not well informed. 
They, they may have a problem with you. Let's say maybe you, you know each other. Oh, so you, you, you people, you say you are a judge and you are a lawyer, and now you are talking. So when, when matters come in court, so what, what then do you do? You know, people who do not understand that judges and lawyers, or let's, let's say judicial officers and lawyers, have ethical codes which guide their behavior, which guide their interactions. So we, we, we need to be very, very careful. And also not just be too friendly. Or because as I say, for you as the, as the one who's involved in this relationship, you might do it honestly. You might do it with all good intentions, bona fide. But someone who looks there, who's informed and a reasonable person, might say, ah, 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 this leaves a bitter aftertaste. It, it does not look good. So I think this is where you need to, to strike the, 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 the balance. So that the independence and the impartiality of the office is not compromised by your personal relations. There might be a time where even your best friend, your closest friend, you need to pack them somewhere until you deal with some issues. Because if you are seen with them, not that you'd be discussing the cases, you'd probably be discussing issues of football or fashion or whatever, or even politics. But someone will, people will not even wait to listen to what you are talking about. The fact that you are seen together, there's only one thing in their minds. Oh, they are talking about the case. A judgment comes, I mean, what did you expect? What did you expect? I saw them. I knew. It was just a matter of time. And then you might find that that is a very well-reasoned judgment, legally correct, everything correct, but because of that, it just takes away everything that makes the judgment. What takes away the goodness in the judgment has been a poor decision-making on interpersonal relations. So I think this is um, very, very important for us to, you know, to try and, 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 and balance out. Hmm. I think I touched on judicial accountability versus judicial independence last week. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to, to deal with that. Okay, let me deal with the conduct of, of court proceedings. One of the things that I probably mentioned in passing, I believe that, and I'm talking about my belief, I believe that a judicial officer should be the one who sets the tone. You must be the one who sets the tone. In terms of punctuality, in terms of dress, in terms of address, when I talk about address, I'm talking about the manner in which you speak. So, the manner in which you appear, I, I, I belong to the old school. I believe that when you appear as a judicial officer, even as a lawyer, people must not ask. You, you come to a, a law firm, you cannot tell who the lawyer is from a clerk, a filing clerk. You cannot tell. The one example I normally make was about some lawyer in, 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 in a country that shall remain nameless, but is now a judge in the industrial court. He would wear worn out shoes. And one day I told him that if, if, if we were just to take a picture of the shoes, we get an accused and we get you, you stand side by side, and you just take the pictures and say, choose which one belongs to a lawyer, which pair belongs to an accused. People would choose yours and say they belong to the accused. No, I'm, I'm very serious. There are people who do not mind about how they look. And in the manner in which they look, they bring disdain upon the judicial office. You cannot tell that this is a magistrate. This is a judge. This is a lawyer. You cannot tell. People just dress anyhow. That, that should not be. So which is why I'm saying that you set the tone, even in your courtroom. I mean, if you come in shabbily dressed, that's what people will know 
is the right thing to do. And in my view, you do not have a right to say, don't do as I do, do as I say. The best way of preaching is to say nothing and do. And when you do, people know, they do not ask, they've got no questions, they just know this is the way. Because some people are very, and, and what you must understand is that some people are very traditional. Let, let me make an example of church. <laughs> there might be people who go to church because of their background, they look at, you know, the way, particularly the young people, they say, ah, they, won't, they won't even hear anything. You find that it's a preacher preaching there, sometimes he's wearing jeans. I've got nothing against jeans. But because of where they were brought up, how they were brought up, they won't even hear the word because of the manner in which the, 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 the preacher was dressed and those who are singing the way they are dressed, you know. So, but in this particular case, courtroom is a different place altogether. That we should not take away. The dignity of the court must be observed. And part of it is brought by the manner in which we dress. I see some people, I just keep quiet and I look at them. I see some lawyers and some judges even. They come to court wearing ceremonial bibs. There's a difference. If it's the official opening of the legal year, there are those bibs, you know, those big ones like this with frills and things. Those are ceremonial. They are not for day-to-day -day work. Do you know that, Miss uh, Mokomele? I'm saying that there are lawyers and judges who come to court wearing ceremonial bibs. The ceremonial, those, those big ones like this, they even cover the whole chest. That, that is not for work. You can't be going to court dealing with a case, whether a criminal or a civil case, wearing those bibs. Those are for cere ceremonies. If it's the official opening of parliament or the legal year, and you're wearing those red gowns with those uh, things, and in other countries they even wear wigs, you wear them there. But when you are going for contest, no. Those are not, there's nothing ceremonial about going to court. You are going there to work. So I just look at it and say, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but some of these things are also born out of ignorance. I've, 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 seen, I've said uh, some words to a few lawyers who appeared. I said, oh, oh, my Lord, I represent. So I said, I cannot see you. I cannot hear you. I cannot understand what you are saying. What is the problem? The bib is here. No, my Lord, but the, 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 the strings are, I, I don't hear anything. If you go to court, your bib must be okay. It must be properly fastened. It must have a, relation, a love relationship with the shirt. Once there is a gap, there is a problem. I don't see you. I do not hear you. I do not understand what you say. One, one even came to court without a bib. I think he had forgotten. So you have to be very, very conscious about when you go out of your chambers. And you say, you say that some of them wearing red shoes, brown shoes, black shoes, boots up to here and so forth. No, no, no. That should not be. Even the witnesses, I think the standards have really now go down. People come to court with T-shirts. There's a case I was doing. This fellow was wearing an Amstel Lager shirt, and he was a witness. And I told him, you cannot do that. If you want to go and drink Amstel, go to a bar and do it. But you cannot bring Amstel things here. And what I do is to blame the lawyers. Because as a lawyer, you are having a client who is coming he does not know court procedures. He does not know the manner of dress. He does not even know the manner of address. How do you address a judge? How do you address a magistrate? It is your duty during the precognition session to tell the client that this is how you must dress. You cannot come there dressed in jeans. You cannot come there dressed in t-shirts or, you know, in, in all sorts of things. For me, when I, was, when, I was, when I was working, when I started working, 
My boss refused for us to wear leather jackets. I was in the AG's chambers. Leather jackets you could not wear at work. But I see some of them. Some of them even wearing gowns and you say, oh my God. There's like a, a leather jacket and, and someone is coming. Even, even some of them, the way they come to see judges in chambers. It, it's very shameful. Very shameful. You find ladies coming with uh, sleeveless dresses. Men coming wearing jeans to see a judge in chambers. And I think, oh my, my. But it is up to us to set the standards high. It might take time, but the fruits will come. When they know that that one is a no nonsense, people, the word will spread very, very quickly around. And when they come to your court, they will behave accordingly, even if they can do other things in other courts. So the message that I want to bring is that you as a judicial officer must set the tone in your own court. Do not be a hypocrite. Don't do as I do, do as I say. You find that you say court agent, we resume at 11. And then you go about if maybe you go for a smoke or you go for a drink and you come at 12. People are waiting for you. No apologies, no explanations, nothing. The fact that you are a judicial officer does not place you above the other people. If you are late, you have to apologize. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, I am late. You cannot then, when a lawyer comes late, have now the, the temerity to start taking them to task when you don't, you know, sometimes come to court on time. Am I hitting a raw nerve? If I am, I'm very happy. No, no, we have to be considerate to the people. If we say we are resuming at 2.15, um, let it be 2.15. If it is not, apologize. They, it does not make you lesser in the eyes of, of the other people when, when, when you apologize. Because you have trampled on, on, on their rights or their legitimate expectation, which you created. So th I think that that is the way to do. But you must be in charge of the court and set the, the standards. And then in this regard, you have to treat the people appearing before you even-handedly, fairly, and equally. Do not have those stereotypes. People who belong to this class, who belong to this ethnic group, who wear such and such clothes. No, 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 no. You have to treat them equally. Disabuse your mind, your mind of all the, you know, all, all the, I don't know what to call it, but those, 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 those thoughts and, you know, which, which cause you to perceive certain people in a certain way. You must just treat them equally and very fairly too and with respect. And in this regard, your behavior towards them, the words, the tone that you use, and your attitude, if those things are not right, may be a basis for them asking for you to recuse yourself. So you need to do things very, very carefully. And, um, you know, always treat people with, with dignity. Treat them with, with dignity. This other time, <laughs> there's a fellow who... Who, who, who came to court, he was, he was Oshivambo speaking. So he came the first day, and he was a man of a very, very few words, very few. He would just, yes, no, yes, no, I went there and whatever. So the following day, suddenly there's just an abundance of words in his mouth, and I wondered where it came from. <laughs> suddenly he was argumentative, and, and, you know, and, and very persistent. Well, the first thing I noted is that he came to court wearing the same shirt that he had been wearing the previous day. But I said, well, you never know. He might be having one shirt, maybe he lives far. I'll, I'll put nothing to this. Then, only to discover that that fellow was drunk. He probably had been drinking the whole night. So... <laughs> Me, me, what's her name now? The interpreter. 
Huh? Yes, Dorcas, yes. She picked it up, so she wrote a note to the lawyer that this man is drunk. And the fellow was, was motherless. So, and that explained why he was behaving in this fashion. So, we then had to postpone the matter, but before I did so, I, 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 I called him to order, and I told him that tomorrow you come here sober. I'm going to run a, 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 a test to see whether if you blow, what colors will, will come there. <laughs> I told him that we'll subject him to a, to a, 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 a sobriety test. We didn't. But the following morning he came and he apologized and everything. But I tried to do it with, with dignity, you know. Um, you have to treat him with dignity. He might have his own problems and maybe reasons why he did what he did. Um, but uh, we, we, we need to be very, you know, very, very, um, uh, what, sensitive. Even when we, we have to issue discipline, we have to be, you know, very measured in our approach and, and, and fair as well. Mr. Justice Lewis Brandes of the United States says that if we require respect for the law, we must first make the law respectable. I've spoken about punctuality. Coming to court on time, and maybe, I, I do not know, <laughs> with, with issues of, I think, with leaving court on time, I do not know what, what, what obtains in, in, the, in the magistracy. But the, the, the thing about it is that, you know, there, there must be no time that you are, there's a case on the road and no one knows where you are. People are waiting. No one knows where you are. You can't be contacted. And one of the things I, I always tell students at JTC and below is that do not think that you are going to change overnight just because you've now finished your university and you are going to work, that you are suddenly going to shed all your reprobate traits. It's not going to happen. What you do now normally sets the standard for what you will be in the future. So one of the things that I have taught myself to do is I always report. Wherever I am, my secretary knows. Ma'am, oh, they were mimicking me yesterday. Ah, these people, they're bad. <laughs> so I'll say, ma'am, oh, I'm going across, I'm going for a haircut, I'm going for a tea, I'm in a cup of tea, or I'm going to work from home, whatever. You, you must, your, your whereabouts must be known so that when you are required, you can be found. Particularly these days, you find that if you are on duty, you must not disappear. They call, phone is not picked up. No, 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 no. That, 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 that is irresponsible. That is irresponsible. We must be people who are there when they are needed because we must remember that at the end of the day, we are here to serve. We are here to serve a community. And we must do so with, um, you know, with, with, um, with a sense of, of duty at all times. There's an issue of dignity. I think I've, I've touched upon it. That is, in, in the conduct of yourself as a judicial officer, both in and out of court. Um, there, there are other things. I don't know. There, there are some things. How does it feel if uh, maybe a, a, a judicial officer, you are walking along Independence uh, Street and you, you have some fat cooks? Is it nice for you to hear? Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, my brother. Oh, in Swaziland, we've got lots of maize, maize, maize cobs. And, uh, you know, around December, this time, yeah, they, 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 they'll be in season. So we like, we like them roasted and we like them cooked. How does it look? You're walking along. <laughs> oh, hello, my brother. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. <laughs> how, 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 is that okay? How does it uh, work together with judicial office? You know, it actually reminds me of <laughs> there is this person who always likes to eat the noise. Uh, you shake your hands. <laughs> yes. 
No, no, but, but what we must, uh, th there's a verse in the Bible that says, it is the small foxes that spoil the vine. So it doesn't have to be big things. Maybe there's nothing that is taken away. But, I mean, it's so undignified for you to be walking in the street and, I mean, it's your food. You, you bought it with your money. You didn't steal it. But th there is no rush for you to eat it right there. Your, your, your chambers are, you know, in the office, not so close by. C can't you just wait, you know, until you get to a place more respectable and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> So, but I, I, th these are some of the small things that we have to be, or even walking in the corridors in court and you find some people maybe eating or, you know, those sorts, sorts of things. We, we need to be careful about. I'm not going to make any rules, but I'm just saying be conscious. One of the issues probably um, is even, I, I, was, I was surprised when I, when I got here. In Swaziland, Police officers who smoke, you, you never know that they smoke. They will walk away somewhere, do their thing, and then come back. And when I was coming, even here at the, at the entrance where, where, where we enter, you find a policeman, oh, hi, hi, judge, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> so sm small things like that. Um, because wh wh what we need to think about is not, is not only our convenience, what is convenient to us, what we enjoy and what we like. But it is more than just us. It is sometimes the office. The things that we do, you will find then start reflecting negatively on the office. So I didn't plan to speak about eating, but it, 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 it's, it, these are some of the things. Yes. Um, and then language language that is used in court. Hey, you chick, sit down. You don't stand up in my court. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you find lawyers, and sometimes you might find judicial officers using that type, type of colloquial language. Guys, chicks. Uh, <laughs> and, and even kids, kids. How many, we said divorce matter, how many kids do you have? Kids are, are baby goats. You don't speak about kids in court, no. They are children. If you're talking about baby goats, yes, you can ask how many, how many kids did your, did your female goat have? Then you are going to tell us. But, I mean, but this is where we start reducing the, 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 the I do not know what to call, of, 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 of the judicial office where people speak colloquial language in court, and it's okay. You find them writing judgments. You, you find, I don't, I wasn't, I can't agree. No, 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 you do not do that. I do not. I cannot. I will not. This won'ts, wasn't, no, no, that, those do not belong to judgments. I want to. Eh. No, 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 all those. So please, let, let us be very, very careful. Even with lawyers, when they use this language or when they include it, in, you have to point it out. Not this, don't, wasn't, couldn't. No, 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 no. Those are not you know, um, words that are supposed to be used in a formal you know, court, court setting. And then, of course, some of them use, uh, I mean, derogatory language and all that. No, no, those must, they just do not belong there. However provoked you may be, you do not start swearing or, you know, all those things. I'm not saying I heard it or saw it, but it's just a no-go zone. We must not even think about it. Judgments vary. No, no, no. If you can just give, I thought you wanted my opinion, and I'm giving it, yes. What, what I'm saying is that judgments are, are, are different. Although they are all written for the public, but... There are certain, there are some judgments which the public will not have much interest in. There might be legal issues where the people interested in those judgments are lawyers. So the level at which you write them might be different. But where you are writing, for instance, a, a judgment, there's an accused person who's appearing before you from two, 
is Tsumkwe. Yes. So if you, if you, although this might be, it might be someone who knows and understands English, but I think you need to communicate. When you write a judgment, you have to decide who are you writing for. Because there are things, for instance, um, you, you might, if you are, it's a criminal uh, case, let's say it's a case of murder. The principles or, 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 or the elements of murder are tried. To who? To you they are tried. But to the accused, he does not know what trite means. And to him, they are not trite. He needs to know why you are convicting, convicting him of the offense. Therefore, you have to say this, 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 and the other. So I, I'm, I'm saying that it depends. There might be cases, as I say, where you are dealing with purely intellectual issues where lawyers would understand and they would be the ones interested. But when you are writing for the common men in the street, then I think you should come down to that level. We like to write well sometimes, but sometimes you overdo it, maybe. No, I, I really, do that one I cannot answer. I do not, because I mean, for me, all that I've, when, when I came, we were doing everything. So we were doing the reviews, criminal reviews. I've never dealt with one civil judgment which came on appeal. So I do not know. I cannot comment on that. But um, as I say, I think probably the judges would need to understand that maybe the level may not be as high as could be because of the understanding of the people for whom and to whom you are communicating the judgment. I think that is something that needs to be taken into account. It's a very, very valid uh, a valid point. It is a valid point. Because sometimes we get carried away and we speak and the people that we speak to maybe do not understand. There's a, I'm sure, but this will probably be an issue that was spoken about when, when they wrote about judgment uh, writing. But there are two, I'm sure you are given some papers yeah. on that. You have not gotten to judgment writing. Ah, then let me stay away from that. I think someone will deal with that and uh, you'll ask those questions. What time do we break? Sorry? 10.30. Maybe this is the ideal time for us to break. Is there any question? I want to move on after this. It happens. And, and I've, I've, I mean, sometimes they just sit and they start talking. That's right. But the proper thing to do is that if you come, you have to write. You have to communicate in writing. You cannot be talking and whispering, but they do it. I've even had occasions where, for instance, you'll find that a lawyer goes out, let's say this is the door through which the court staff come. Or someone just comes in there, they want to go to the next court, the shortcut is coming here, and then walking out. And then I tell them that my court is not a thoroughfare. But that these, are, these are the things that we need to do and be strict upon because they then steal away the dignity of the court if we allow them to happen. You, you find them coming there, talking. Sometimes they're having a conference, three or four, during case management. The, the, the proceedings are going on. Some of them even lose a hearing when their cases are called because they are deep in conversation. And I think this is something that we need to be very, very strict about because if we do not nip it in the bud, it is going to become part of the culture. And it is not right. The other day I was sitting with, maybe I've also, I've also become a little accustomed to, to eat. I was sitting with Lotta about two or three weeks ago. We're doing second motion. So we did it and finished. And then the doctor, she said, Judge, uh, I'm really a, 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 appalled. I said, why? <laughs> None. Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's take the morning break.